Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage here in Seattle, Washington for AWS's Marketplace Seller Conference. It's the big news within the Amazon Partner Network combining with Marketplace, forming the Amazon Partner Organization, part of a big reorg as they grow to the next level, next gen cloud, mid game on the chessboard. Uh, Cube's got to cover. I'm John Furrier, host of Cube. A great guest here from Databricks, both Cube alumni, Jack Anderson, GM of the, and VP of the Databricks partnership team for AWS, you handle that relationship, and Joel Minnick, Vice President of Product and Partner Marketing. You guys are the, have the keys to the kingdom with Databricks and AWS. Thanks for joining, thanks for, good to see you again. Thanks for having us yeah, back. John, great to be here. So I feel like we're at reInvent 2013, small event, no stage, but there's a real shift happening with procurement. Um, obviously it makes, it's a no-brainer on the micro, you know, people should be buying online, self-service, cloud scale, but Amazon's got billions being sold through their marketplace, they've reorganized their partner network. You can see kind of what's going on, they've kind of figured it out, like let's put everything together and simplify and make it less of a website marketplace, merge our partners, they have more synergy and frictionless experiences so everyone can make more money and customers can be happier. <laughs> yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, I mean, you're running yeah. a relationship, you're in the middle of it, well, Amazon's mental model here is that they want the world's best ISVs to operate on AWS so that we can collaborate and co-architect uh, on behalf of customers. And that's exactly what the APO and Marketplace allow us to do, is to work with Amazon uh, yeah. on these really you know, unique use cases. You know, I interviewed Ali many times over the years. I remember many years ago, I think six, maybe six, seven years ago, we were talking, he's like, we're all in on AWS. Obviously now, the success of Databricks, you've got multiple clouds, see that, customers will have choice. But I remember the strategy early on, it was like, we're going to be deep. So this is, speaks volumes to the, the relationship you have, years. Jack, take us through the relationship that Databricks has with AWS from a, from a partner perspective, Joel, and from a product perspective, mm -hmm. because it's not like you guys are Johnny come lately new to the, new to the scene. Right. You've been there, almost present creation of this wave. What's the relationship and how does it relate to what's going on today? So, so most people may not know that Databricks was born on AWS. We actually did our first $100 million of revenue on Amazon. And today we're obviously available on multiple clouds, uh, but we're very fond of our Amazon relationship. And when you look at uh, uh, what the APN allows us to do, you know, we're able to expand our reach and co-sell with Amazon and Marketplace broadens our reach. And so we think of Marketplace in three different aspects. We've got the Marketplace private offer business, which we've been doing for a number of years. Matter of fact, we, uh, we're driving uh, well over 100% uh, year-over-year growth in private offers. And we have a nine-figure business, so it's a very significant business. And when a customer um, uses a private offer, that private offer counts against their private pricing agreement with AWS. So they get pricing power against their, their private pricing. So it's really important, it goes on their Amazon bill. Uh, in May, we launched our pay-as-you-go on-demand offering, and uh, in five short months, we have well over 1,000 subscribers. And what this does is it really uh, reduces the barriers to entry, it's low friction. So anybody in an enterprise or startup or public sector company can start to use Databricks on AWS and pay a consumption-based model and have it go against their monthly bill. And so we see customers you know, doing rapid experimentation, pilots, POCs, uh, they're, they're really learning the value of that first use case, and then we see rapid use case expansion. <coughs> and the third aspect is the consulting partner private offer, CPPO, super important in how we involve our partner ecosystem of our consulting partners and our resellers that are able to uh, work with Databricks uh, on behalf of customers. So you get the big, contracts with the private offer. You got the product market fit kind of people iterating with data, coming in with the, with the buy as you go, and obviously the integration piece all fitting exactly. in there. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so that's that, that, those are the offers, that, that's mm -hmm. current what's in Marketplace today. Is that the products? What are, yeah. what are people buying? I mean, yeah. I guess what's the, Joel, what are, what are people buying in the Marketplace? And what does it mean for them? So fundamentally, what they're buying is the ability to take silos out of their organization. And that's, that is, the problem that Databricks is out there to solve, which is when you look across your data landscape today, you've got unstructured data, you've got structured data, you've got real-time streaming data, and your teams are trying to use all of this data to solve really complicated problems. And as Databricks, as the Lakehouse company, what we're helping customers do is how do they get into the new world? How do they move to a place where they can use all of that data across all of their teams? Mm -hmm. And so we allow them to begin to find through the marketplace those rapid adoption use cases where they can 
get rid of these data warehousing, data lake silos they've had in the past, get their unstructured and structured data onto one data platform, an open data platform that is no longer adherent to any proprietary formats and standards, uh, something they can very much, very easily integrate into the rest of their data environment. Apply one common data governance layer on top of that, so that from the time they ingest that data to the time they use that data to the time they share that data, inside and outside of their organization, they know exactly how it's flowing. They know where it came from, they know who's using it, they know who has access to it, they know how it's changing. And then with that common data platform, with that common governance solution, they'd be able to bring all of those use cases together across their real-time streaming, their data engineering, their BI, their AI, all of their teams working on one set of data. Uh, and that lets them move really, really fast, and it also lets them solve challenges they just couldn't solve before. Uh, a good example of this, you know, one of the world's now largest data streaming platforms runs on Databricks with AWS. And if you think about what does it take to set that up? Well, they've got all this customer data that was historically inside of data warehouses that they have to understand who their customers are. They have all this unstructured data they've built their data science model so they can do the right kinds of recommendation engines and forecasting around. And then they've got all this streaming data going back and forth between clickstream data from what the customers are doing with their platform and the recommendations they want to push back out. And if those teams were all working in individual silos, building these kinds of platforms would be extraordinarily slow and complex. But by building it on Databricks, they were able to release it in record time um, and have grown at, at record pace. To I mean, now that's be the product, that's impacting product development. Absolutely. I mean, this is like the yeah. difference between lagging months of product development to like days. Pretty yes. much what you're getting at. Yes. So total agility. Mm -hmm. I got that. Okay. Now I'm a customer. I want to buy in the marketplace, but I also you got direct sales force mm -hmm. yep. up there. So how do you guys look at this? Is there channel conflict? Are there comp programs? Because one of the things I heard today in, on the stage from AWS's leadership, uh, Chris was up there speaking, and 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 Mona was, hey. He's the CRO conference chief revenue officer mm -hmm. conversation, which means someone's getting compensated. So if I'm the sales rep at Databricks, what's my motion to the customer? Do I get paid? Does Amazon sell it? Take us through yeah. that. Is there a channel conflict? Is there, or an audio analyst? Well, I'd, I'd add what Joel just talked about <laughs> with, with you know, what the solution, the value of the solution. Our entire offering is available on AWS Marketplace. So it's not a subset, it's the entire Databricks offering. And um, the flagship, yeah. all the, the top everything. Stuff. The flagship, yeah. the complete offering. So it's not, it's not segmented, it's not a sub-segment, it's, okay. it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can use all of our different offerings. Now, when it comes to uh, seller compensation, we, we, we view this two, two different ways, right? One is that AWS is also incented, right, versus selling a native service to recommend Databricks for the right situation. Same thing with Databricks. Our sales force wants to do the right thing for the customer if the customer wants to use Marketplace as their procurement vehicle. And that really helps customers because if you get Databricks and five other ISVs together, and let's say each ISV is spending, a, you're spending a million dollars, you have five million dollars of spend, you put that spend through the flywheel with AWS Marketplace, and then you can use that in your negotiations with AWS to get better pricing overall. So uh, that's how we, we so do it. So customers are driving this Correct. sounds like. for sure. So they're looking at this as saying, hey, I'm going to just get purchasing power with all my relationships because it, it's a solution yeah. architectural market, right? Yeah, it makes mm -hmm. sense because if most customers will have a primary and secondary cloud provider, if they can consolidate you know, multiple ISV spend through that same primary provider, you get yeah. pricing power. Okay, Joel, we're going to date ourselves, at least I will. So back in the old days, <laughs> it used to be do a Barney deal with someone, hey, let's go to market together, you got to get paper, you do a biz dev mm -hmm. deal. And then you got to say, okay, now let's coordinate our sales teams. A lot of moving parts. So what you're getting at here is that the alternative for Databricks or any company is to go find those partners and do deals versus now Amazon is the center point for the customer. So that you can still do those joint deals, but this seems to be flipping the script a little bit. Well, it is, but we still have uh, VARs and consulting partners that are doing implementation work, very valuable work, advisory work, that can actually work with Marketplace through the CPPO offering. So, the Marketplace allows multiple ways to procure your solution. So it doesn't change your business structure, it just makes it more efficient. That's like, correct. That's, that's like a great it. way to say it. Yeah, that's, okay. that's, so that's So that's it, so that just makes, makes it more efficient. So you guys are actually incented to point customers to the marketplace. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Economically. Yeah. E economically, it's the right thing to do for the customer, it's the right thing to do for our relationship with Amazon, especially when it comes back to co-selling, right? Because 
uh, Amazon now is leaning in with ISVs and making recommendations mm -hmm. for you know, an ISV solution. And our teams are working backwards yeah. from those use cases you know, to collaborate and land them. Yeah, I want, I want to well, get that out there. Go ahead, Joel. So one of the other things I might add to that too, you know, and why this is advantageous for, for companies like Databricks to, to work through the marketplace, is it makes it so much easier for customers to deploy a solution. It's, it's very literally one click through the marketplace to get Databricks stood up inside of your environment. Um, and so if you're looking at how do I help customers most rapidly adopt these solutions in the AWS cloud, the marketplace is a fantastic accelerator to that. You know, it's interesting, I want to bring this up and get your reaction to it because to me, I think this is the future of procurement. So mm -hmm. from a procurement standpoint, I mean, again, dating myself, EDI back in the old days, you know, all that craziness. Now this is all the, all the internet, basically through the console. Mm -hmm. I get the infrastructure side, you know, spin up and provision some servers, all been good, mm -hmm. you guys have played well there in the marketplace, but now as we get into more of what I call the um, business apps, and they brought this up on stage, a little nuance. Most enterprises aren't yet there of integrating tech on the business apps into the stack. This is where I think you guys are a use case of success where you guys have been successful with data integration. Mm -hmm. It's an integrator's dilemma, not an innovator's dilemma. So like, I want to integrate. So now I have integration points mm -hmm. with Databricks, but I want to put an app in there. I want to provision an application, but it has to be built. It's not, you don't buy it, you build, you got to build stuff. And this is the nuance. What's your reaction to that? Am I getting this right or, or am I off? Because no one's going to be buying software like they used to. They buy software to integrate it mm -hmm. in. Yeah, no, I think everything's integrated. Now. I think AWS has done a great job at creating a partner ecosystem, right, to give customers the right tools for the right jobs, and those might be with third parties. Databricks is doing the same thing with our Partner Connect program, right? We've got customer customer partners like Fivetran and DBT that you know, augment and enhance our platform. And so you, you're yeah. looking at multi-ISV architectures and all of that can be procured through the AWS marketplace. Yeah, it's almost like you know, bundling and unbundling. I was talking about this with, the, with Dave Vellante about SuperCloud, which is why wouldn't a customer want the best solution in their architecture, mm -hmm. period, in its class. If someone's got API security or an API gateway, well, you know, I don't want to be forced to buy something because it's part of a suite. And that's where you see things get uh, sub-optimized, where mm -hmm. someone dominates a category and they have, oh, you got to buy my version of this. Yeah, Joel, uh, Joel, and and I were, Joel and I were talking, we were actually saying what, what's really important about Databricks is that customers control the data, right? You want to comment on that? Is yeah, that I was going to say, the, um, you know, what you're pushing on there we think is extraordinarily, you know, the way the market is going to go is that Customers want a lot of control over how they build their data stack. And everyone's unique in what tools are the right ones for them. And so one of the, you know, philosophically I think really strong places Databricks and AWS have lined up is we both take an approach that you should be able to have maximum flexibility on the platform. And as we think about the lake house, one thing we've always been extremely committed to as a company is building the data platform on an open foundation. And we do that primarily through Delta Lake and making sure that, to Jack's point, with Databricks, the data is always in your control and that it's always stored in a completely open format. And that is one of the things that's allowed Databricks to have the breadth of integrations that it has with all the other data tools out there because you're not tied into any proprietary format, uh, but instead are able to take advantage of all the innovation that's happening out there in the open source ecosystem. When you see uh, other solutions out there that aren't as open as you guys, you guys are very open. By the way, we love that too. We think that's a great strategy. But what's the, what am I foreclosing if I go with something else that's not as open? What's the customer's downside as you think about what's around the corner in the industry? Because if you believe it's going to be open, open source, mm -hmm. which I think open source software is the software industry, and integration is a big deal, because software's going to be plentiful. Like, sure. Let's face it, it's a good time to be in the software business but cloud's booming. So what's the downside from your Databricks perspective? You see a buyer clicking on Databricks versus that alternative. What's potentially is, should they be nervous about down the road if they go with a, a more proprietary or locked in yeah. approach? Well, I think the challenge with proprietary ecosystems is you become beholden to the ability of that provider to both build relationships um, and convince other vendors that they should invest in that format. Uh, but you're also then beholden to the pace at which that provider is able to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've seen lots of times over history where 
you know, a proprietary format may run ahead for a while on a lot of innovation, but as that market control begins to solidify, that desire to innovate begins to, to degrade. Yeah. Um, whereas in the open format, So abstract rents versus innovation. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'll in, say it. <laughs> in the open world, you know, you have to continue to innovate. Yeah. And the open source world is always innovating. If you look at the last 10 to 15 years, I challenge you to find you know, an example where the innovation in the data and AI world is not coming from open source. Um, and so by investing in open ecosystems, that means you are always going to be yeah. at the forefront of what is the latest. You know, again, not to date myself again, but you look back at the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. the protocol stacks were proprietary. Yeah. You yeah. know, SNA at IBM, DECnet was digital, you know, the rest is, and then TCP IP was part of the open systems interconnect. Mm -hmm. Revolutionary, obviously Cal had a big part of that, as well as my school did. Uh, and so like, you know, that was, but it didn't standardize the whole stack. It stopped at IP mm -hmm. and, and TCP. Yeah. But that helped interoperate. That created a nice de facto. So this is a big part of this mid-game, I call it the chessboard. You know, you got opening game and mid-game, mm -hmm. then you got the end game. And we're not there at the end game yet in cloud. There's, cloud. there's, al there's always some form of lock-in, right? Andy Jassy will, will address it, you know, when making a decision. But if you're going to make a decision, you want to reduce it. As, uh, you don't want to be limited, right? So I would advise a customer that there could be limitations with the proprietary architecture. And if you look at what every customer is trying to become right now is an AI driven yeah. business, right? And so it has to do with can you get that data out of silos? Can you, can you organize it and secure it? And then can you work with data scientists to feed those models yeah. uh, in, a, in a very consistent manner? And so the tools of tomorrow will, to Joel's point, will be open and we yeah. want interoperability with those and, tools. And, yeah. and choice is a matter too. And I, I would say that you know, the argument for why I think Amazon is not as locked in as maybe some other clouds, is that they have to compete directly too. Redshift competes directly with a lot of other stuff, but they can't play the bundling game because the customers are getting savvy to the fact that if you try to bundle an inferior product with something else, it may not work great at all, <laughs> and they're going to be, they're onto it. This well, is the, this Am is the- To Amazon's credit, by having these, these uh, solutions that may compete with native services and marketplace, they are providing customers with choice, yeah. low price, and access to convenience. The, and access to the core value, yeah, which exactly. is the hardware, which mm -hmm. is their platform. Okay, so I want to get you guys thought on something else I see emerging. This is again, kind of cube uh, rumination moment. So on stage, Chris unpacked a lot of stuff. I mean, this marketplace, they're touching a lot of hot buttons here. You know, pricing, compensation, workflows, um, services behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he mentioned was they talked about resellers or channel partners. Depending on what you talk about, we believe, Dave and I believe on theCUBE that the entire indirect sales channel of the industry is going to be disrupted radically. Because those players were selling hardware in the old yeah. days and software. That game is going to change. You, know, you mentioned you guys have a program. I want to get your thoughts on this. We believe that once this gets set up, they can play in this game and bring their services in, which means that the old reseller channels are going to be rewritten. They're going to be refactored um, with this new kinds of access. Because you've got scale, you've got money, and you've got product. And you've got customers coming into the marketplace. So if you're like a reseller that sold computers to data centers or software, you're uh, you know, a, a value-added reseller or VAB or business. You've got to evolve. Right? You've, you've got, got, to, you've got to be evolve. here. Yes. Yeah. How are you guys working with those partners? Because you say you have a product in your marketplace there. How do I make money if I'm a reseller with Databricks with Amazon? Take me through that use case. Well, I'll let Joel comment, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Customers need expertise, they need know-how. Uh, you know, when we're seeing customers do mass migrations to the cloud, or Hadoop specific migrations, or data transformation implementations, they need expertise from consulting and SI partners. If those consulting and SI partners happen to resell the solution as well, well that's another aspect of their business, but you know, I, I really think it is the expertise that the partners bring uh, to help customers get outcomes. Joel, channel, yeah. big opportunity for re re Amazon to reimagine this. For sure, yeah, and I think, you know, to your comment about how do resellers take advantage of that, I think what Jack was pushing on is spot on, which is it's becoming more, about, more and more about the expertise you bring to the table. Um, and not just transacting the software, but now actually helping customers make the right choices. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we're seeing uh, you know, both SIs begin to be able to resell solutions and finding a lot of opportunity in that. Yeah. And I think we're seeing traditional resellers begin to move into that SI model as well. And that's going to be the evolution that this goes. At the end of the day, it's about services, right? For sure. I mean, yeah. if, For sure. if you've got a great yeah. service, you're going to have high gross profits. And I think the, the, yeah. the managed service provider business is alive yeah. and well, right? Because yeah. there are a number of customers that want that, yeah. that type of a service. I think that's going to be a really hot, hot button for you guys. I think being the way you guys are open, this channel, partner services model coming in to the fold really kind of makes for kind of that super cloud-like experience where you guys now have an ecosystem, and that's my next question. You guys have an ecosystem going on mm -hmm. within Databricks. For sure. On top of this ecosystem. <laughs> How does that work? This is kind of like, hasn't been written up in business school and case studies yet. <laughs> this is new. What is this? I think you know, what it comes down to is you're seeing ecosystems begin to evolve around the data platforms. And that's going to be one of the big kind of new horizons for us as we think about what drives ecosystems. It's going to be around, well, what is the, what's the data platform that I'm using? And then all the tools that have to encircle that to get my business done. Uh, and so, I think there's you know, absolutely ecosystems inside of the AWS business on all of AWS's services across data analytics and AI. Um, and then to your point, you are seeing ecosystems now arise around Databricks and its Lakehouse platform yeah. as well, as customers are looking at, well if I'm standing these Lakehouses up and I'm beginning to invest in this, then I need a whole set of tools yeah. that help me get that done as well. I mean, you yeah. think about ecosystem theory, we're living a whole nother dream. And I'm, and I'm not kidding, it hasn't yet been written up in <laughs> For sure. business school yeah. case studies, is that we're now in a whole nother connective tissue, ecology thing happening where you have dependencies and value proposition, economics, mm -hmm. connectedness, so you have relationships in these ecosystems. And I think one of the great things about the relationships of these ecosystems is that there's a high degree of overlap. Yeah. So you're seeing that you know, the way that the cloud business is evolving, the, the ecosystem partners of Databricks are the same ecosystem yeah. partners of AWS. Yeah. And so as you build these platforms out into the cloud, you're able to really take advantage yeah. of best of breed, the broadest yeah. set of solutions out there for you. Joel, Jack, I love it because you know what it means? The best ecosystem will win if you keep it open. For sure. You can see everything if you're going to do it in the dark. You know, you don't know the outcome. I mean, this is really kind of what we're talking about. And John, can I just add that when I was at Amazon, we had a, a theory that there's buyers and builders, right? There's very innovative companies that want to build things themselves. Yeah. We're seeing now that, that builders want to buy a platform, right? Yeah. And so there's a platform decision being made and that ecosystem is going to evolve around the platform. Yeah, and That's I totally point. agree. And, and, and the word innovation gets kicks around. That's why, you know, when we had our super cloud panel, it was called the innovator's dilemma with a slash through it, it's called the integrator's dilemma. Innovation is the digital transformation. So Absolutely. like that becomes cliche in a way, but it really becomes more of a, are you open, are you integrating? If APIs are now connective tissue, what's the automation, what's the service meshes look like? I mean, a whole nother set of kind of thinking goes on in these new ecosystems and these new products. Well, and, that, and that thinking is, uh, has been born in Delta sharing, yeah. right? So yeah. the idea that you can have a multi-cloud implementation of Databricks and yeah. actually share data between those two different clouds. That is the next yeah. layer on top of the native cloud solution. Well, Databricks has done a good job of building on top of the goodness of, and the CapEx gift from AWS, but you guys have done a great job taking that, building differentiation into the product. You guys have great customer base, great growing ecosystem, and again, I think in a, a shining example of what every enterprise is going to do. Build on top of something, operating model, get that operating model driving revenue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well <we> whether, <laughs> whether you're Goldman Sachs or Capital One or I, XYZ I, Corporation. S&P Global, NASDAQ, yeah. right? Yep. We, we've got, yeah. you know, yeah. these, the biggest verticals in the world are solving tough problems with Databricks. Right. I think we'd be remiss, because if Ali was here, he would really want to thank Amazon for all of the investments across all of the different uh, functions, whether it's the relationship we have with our engineering and service teams, yep. our marketing teams, uh, you know, product development, um, and we're going to be at reInvent, yeah. a big presence yeah. at reInvent, we're looking forward to seeing you there again. Yeah. We'll see you guys there. Yeah, again, it's good ecosystem. I love the ecosystem evolutions happening. This next gen cloud is here, we're seeing this evolve. Kind of new economics, new value propositions kind of scaling up, producing more. So, 
You guys are doing a great job. Thanks for coming on theCUBE and taking yeah, thank the time, you. Joel. Great to see you at the chat. Thanks for having us, Thanks for Okay, CUBE coverage here. The world's changing as APN comes to give the marketplace for a new partner organization at Amazon Web Services. The Cube's got it covered. This should be a very big, growing ecosystem as this continues. Billions are being sold through the marketplace. And of course, the buyers are happy as well. So we've got it all covered. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. Thanks for watching.